Hey, welcome back to Linear Algebra. We're going to start our work in section 2.3 in this video lecture talking about composing linear maps, linear transformations. And in the previous lecture, we talked about adding them and scaling them and how the corresponding matrices that you get by choosing ordered bases add and scale in the same way. So in this, in this one, we're going to look at composing them in the sense of function composition. So I want to show, uh, just to kind of walk you through the outline here, I want to show that the composition of linear maps is again linear. That's theorem 2.9 in the text. Just going to kind of discuss, leaving most of the work to you, some of it will be a formal exercise, the algebra of this new vector space of linear transformations. I'll tell you what I mean by the algebra of it here in a second. That's theorem 2.10. Uh, and then I want to show that uh, uh, the composition of two linear maps has a matrix once you choose ordered bases, and the matrix of that composition turns out to just be the product of the matrices of the maps individually. That's theorem 211. We'll walk through the proof of that in detail. And then again, just a discussion of the uh, algebra of the, uh, the m by n matrices. That's theorem 212. We won't be going through detailed proofs of that, but I'm going to try to nudge you into trying to write down some of those proofs uh, uh, for yourself. Okay, so that's the outline, let's get going. So theorem 2.9 is our first result. It's about the composition of maps. It looks like it has kind of a, a complicated statement, but, but really uh, it's not really saying all that much. Let's just see if we can understand it. So we have three, three vector spaces, U, W, or so, so, excuse me, V, W, and Z. <clears throat> there are three vector spaces all over this field F, and then I have two linear maps. One goes from V to W, and one goes from W to Z, okay? I wish I would have left myself enough room to draw a little picture of this here. Uh, uh, maybe I can try to squeeze it in. If the vector space V, is, say, looks like that, this is kind of a little Venn diagram-like picture, then my first linear map T maps V into this vector space W, okay? The second linear map U maps W into a vector space Z, so the composition of them, that is the two-step process, which in, in, in uh, uh, calculus composition is written with this circle. So I'd be talking about the function u composed with t. You can see it in my notation here that we're just going to write that ut. So if I have two functions and I stick them next to each other, it means composition. And the usual order, t goes and then u goes. Yeah, u composed with t means you take u of t of something. And that's a map from V all the way over to Z. And the theorem is that if U and V are, sorry, T and U are both linear, then so is the composition. Okay, so, so how to prove this? Well, let's give, well, this is just the preamble in the proof. Uh, uh, so notice, like maybe as a homework co comment too, I'm indicating where my proof starts. And then I'm not just assuming that the reader knows what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm saying like, well, let's let these things be vector spaces. I'm identifying what my field is, their vector spaces over F. Make the hypothesis. Suppose that these maps are both linear. All right, so that's just rewriting the hypothesis. And then if I want to show that the composition is linear, I should take a couple of elements in the domain. Composition's domain is V and take a scalar, right? And then by using only the definition of composition and the linearity of T and U separately, we'll just make the computation. So how does the computation look? Well, I take the composition's value on CX plus Y. So I'm combining the two steps of linearity into one. And now I'm just going to walk you through it. This first line, that's function composition, right? UT of something is U of T of the thing. And now I'm using the linearity of T. T of CX plus Y is C times T of X plus T of Y. Now I'm using the linearity of U push u through there, right? u of c times something plus something is blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, and then the last line is just rewriting that as a composition. All right, so it's a quick proof. There's a proof. x and y were any elements of the domain. c was any scalar. So that shows that e, the composition of u and t uh, uh, is, is itself linear. Cool. Real quick uh, notational comment. Um, if the vector space, uh, uh, the domain and the codomain of your linear transformation are the same, then we shorten the uh, notation for LVV and we just write L of V. So if it looks like I'm missing a vector space, it's just sort of a shorthand for the domain and the codomain vector spaces are the same. Uh, and, and people, you know, language develops over time. When the domain and the codomain are the same, people call the linear map a linear operator. 
So a linear operator by definition is a linear function t from a vector space to itself. Okay, and just to summarize a little bit, we've been talking about linear operators can be added together, they can be scaled, that was last time. Theorem 2.7, the set of all linear maps is a vector space. Linear operators can also be composed. That's what we just talked about, although the domain and codomain weren't the same up there, but <clears throat> if they are, you can compose them. So the composition of a linear operator with another linear operator is a linear operator on V. Some more notation in the book uh, uh, by this, this is the letter I. Uh, I is the function from V to V. It's just the identity map, it sends every element to itself. Uh, I'm going to leave it to you to show that that's also a linear map. And sometimes the book writes I sub V to emphasize that the uh, it's the identity from V to V. Sometimes they just write I. Okay. Second theorem, 210. I'm going to leave the proof of this theorem to you. A uh, part of your homework, uh, uh, I think it's number eight. Sorry about that. I can't remember for sure. Uh, uh, but I'm going to ask you to prove this theorem, but I'm just going to ask you to prove part A. You don't have to write out the proof of all four parts, but what this theorem is saying is if you have a vector space and you take three linear operators on it, then some familiar algebraic formulas hold, right? So, so this product right here, it's composition. These are functions. So remember when I write them next to each other, it's composition. So the, the first one is saying that function composition distributes over addition of operators. Uh, uh, the second one is sort of an associativity for function composition, maybe in math 220, 240, excuse me, you proved that function composition is associative in general. So you could use that proof here. Uh, uh, the third one is just saying that when you compose with the identity function, you get the thing back. So it act, kind of acts like a multiplicative identity with respect to composition. And the last one is saying that if you scale a composition, you can scale either factor, right? So you can scale U1 composed with U2, that's the leftmost one. You could scale U1 first and then compose with U2. You could scale U2 first and then compose with U1. You always get the same thing. Okay, I'm gonna leave the proofs of those things to you. Uh, part B, or part A rather, a formal homework exercise. Let me just say that every, every statement here, every statement is a statement that two functions are equal. So you show that they do the same thing to everything in their domain. Yeah, you show that if you plug a V into this side and you plug a V into the right hand side, you get the same output. So that's how those proofs will go. You show that functions are the same by showing that they have the same output for every possible input. The two functions have the same output, input by input. Okay, so let's move on. I think you're familiar with how to multiply matrices. I'm going to assume you are. This is just sort of an algebraic definition of it. So if I take a matrix called A, it's M by N. It has M rows and N columns. Its entries are in F. Take another one, B. It has N rows and P columns, entries over F. Then the matrix product AB is defined. And by definition, it's an M times P matrix, yeah? So that you get the number of rows is the number of rows in the left factor. The number of columns is the number of columns in the right factor. The uh, interior dimensions, the number of columns of the left factor, rows of the right factor, they have to match in order for this, this definition to be defined. And here, what am I telling you? I'm just telling you what the IK entry is. The IK entry of the matrix AB is calculated by you take AIJ and you multiply it by BJK and you sum all such products as J goes from one to N, all right? So I think you're familiar with this. This is just, and it's important to study this formula until it makes sense to you because oftentimes it's the mechanics of a proof. I'm gonna give you some examples of that later on in this lecture. But, but this is the familiar, if you imagine the matrix A over here on the left and the matrix B over here on the right, this is the familiar, I'm just taking the ith row of A and the jth column, or the kth column of B, excuse me, and, and I'm multiplying their entries, okay? And I apologize here, and I'm not even gonna try to fix it, but here I meant capitals. I meant capital A, I1, capital A, I2. I don't mean anything different here. Maybe I should fix it just for completeness. So I'm going to take the ith row of the matrix capital A. So that's got things in it like A, I1, 
AI2 and so on. The last one would be AIN. The kth column of B, B, uh, <clears throat> 1K, B, 2K. So the column subscript is not changing. The last one would be B, N, K. Okay, so the number of entries in this row is the same as the number of entries in this column. So you just multiply them. A, I, 1, B, J, or B, 1, K. A, I, 2, B, 2, K. Add them all up. That's how, you, that's how you find the IK entry of the product. Okay, good. So theorem 211. What does theorem 211 say? It's about compositions again. So we have three vector spaces. They're finite dimensional all over the same field F. And I've picked ordered bases. I should put the word ordered in here. Ordered bases, okay? Alpha is the basis for V. Beta is a basis for W, gamma is a basis for Z. So I'm just going to keep things in alphabetical order, right? V, W, Z, uh, uh, alpha, beta, gamma. Good. Okay. Now we also are assuming we have two linear operators. T goes from V to W, U goes from W to Z. Then the conclusion of the theorem is that the matrix of the composition with respect to the ordered basis alpha and gamma you should stop and make sure that that makes sense. Yeah, I would draw that same picture. You're mapping V to W by T, and you're mapping W to Z by U. So the composition QT, sorry, I'm kind of squeezing this in, ruining my, my nice picture here. UT is a map from V to Z. So this matrix makes sense, right? It would be in the basis alpha, gamma. Alpha is a basis for V, gamma is a basis for Z. So the theorem is saying that that matrix is found by taking the product of the matrices for U and T respectively. And again, these notations make sense. U maps W to Z. So that should be a matrix beta, gamma. Uh, uh, T maps V to W, so that would be alpha, beta. Okay, so what have I got to show? This thing, this theorem 211 says two matrices are equal. This matrix equals that matrix. So I am just going to compute out the uh, entries of each one of these matrices, compute it out on the left, compute it out on the right, and show that they give the same thing. That's going to be the structure of my proof. It's the only way I know how to show two matrices are equal, is to show that they have the same entries, index by index, rows and columns. Okay, so for some notation, I hope this notation is starting to familiar. I'm going to call the ordered basis alpha uh, a subset of V, Vs. Say V has dimension N. Betas will be called Ws. There's M of them. Gammas are Zs. There's P of them. Okay, so in my notation here, I'm indicating that the dimension of V is N. The dimension of W is M. The dimension of uh, Z is P. Okay, and you can kind of see what these matrices uh, dimensions are. Let me just write them up here. If T is a map from a V to W, then its matrix is M by N, yeah? U is a map from W to Z, so its matrix is P by M. That's good, at least that matrix product makes sense. The inner uh, entries match. And what should the product of the, uh, the dimension of the product be? It should be a P by N, and it is. Okay, so that's what we're about to prove, but I'm just checking the dimensionality of the equation. Okay, so some more notation. I would, I would pause this video a lot and kind of make sure that what I'm writing sinks in. It's important to learn how to manipulate these things. So I'm gonna take a basis vector in alpha, pick a J and take T of it. T of it can be written uniquely as a linear combination of the beta basis, the basis of Ws, and I'm calling the coefficients Aijs. Okay, I goes from one to M. So that's just a way of saying that the matrix of T in the alpha beta basis, calling its entries Aij. I goes from one to M, J goes from one to N. It's an M by N matrix. Okay, likewise, for every one of the Ws, take U of it, 
right? That is a linear combination of the Z's. You get coefficients that I'm calling BKIs. Uh, uh, so the matrix of U in the beta gamma basis is the matrix BKI. K goes from one to P, I goes from one to M. It's a P by M matrix. I do that for every one of the W basis vectors, okay? So now I'm just gonna use the definition of matrix multiplication. I can take this matrix U beta gamma. We just said it's P by M. I can multiply it on the left by the matrix T alpha beta. That's P by N, uh, or excuse me, uh, M by N. And we're gonna get a P by N matrix. We commented on that above. And what's its KJ entry? What's K? K is any number between one and P. J is any number between one and N. It's KJ entry by the definition of mul matrix multiplication. So here I, I wanna say something. I'm writing this matrix, right? So this is matrix notation, and then a little floating KJ down there. Remember, when you have the name of a matrix, if you write a little subscript KJ, you're talking about the KJ entry. And by the definition of matrix multiplication, I take the kth row of the matrix U, and I take entry by entry products with the jth column of the matrix uh, for T, all right? So, so uh, uh, K is fixed, it's the kth row. J is fixed, it's the jth column. I is my index of summation. It goes from one to M. Okay, so that's by the definition of matrix multiplication. I'm gonna call that equation one, so I can refer to it in a minute. Good, <clears throat> talking fast here. On the other hand, if I wanna find the matrix for an operator, UT, remember, is a map from V to W. What do I do? I apply it to every basis vector and write it as a linear combination. Okay, well, uh, uh, by the definition of composition, ut of vj is u of t of vj, right? t of vj, we already said, is given by that expression. Now use the, the linearity of the map u, push u through this sum. Uh, I'm continuing down here so that, that I didn't have to scroll so much. So if I push u through that sum, the scalars come out and I have the sum as i goes from one to n of a i j of u of w i. But u of w i, we said above, is given by this expression. You can stop the video and go back. It was what defined uh, uh, the matrix for u in the beta gamma basis. So I'm just substituting that in. And now what am I doing? Well, I have the sum of a sum. I'm just rearranging the term. So I sum i goes from one to m, k goes from one to p of the product of all those things. And uh, what am I doing here? I'm just rearranging the order of the sum. I can fix the k's first and let the i's go. Adding things up doesn't matter what order you get them in. And for that matter, I can rearrange the order of this product. So I'm gonna write it as bki a i j times zk. And now when I look at this thing, what have I done? I've taken a linear map, and I've applied it to the jth basis vector, and I'm writing it as a linear combination of the basis vectors and the target. So these numbers then form the jth column of the matrix for UT, yeah? These numbers, B, K, I, A, I, J, are exactly the numbers that form the jth column of this matrix. Uh, uh, how many rows does the matrix have? It has P rows. So for every value of K, the KJ entry of this matrix is, is written right there. So, so to, to write that down, if you take a, a K, sorry about that, you take a K between one and P, and you take a J between one and N, then by definition, this matrix UT alpha gamma's KJ entry is the coefficient of the ZK. That coefficient of ZK is not a single element, rather it's a sum, right? For a fixed K, I just bracketed in red what the coefficient of that ZK is. So this is by definition the KJ entry of the matrix UT in the alpha gamma basis. I'm calling that equation two, right? If you scroll back up in the video or, or, or re reverse the video and compare the results of equation one and equation two, they're precisely the same. So, so comparing those two things, uh, uh, the KJ entries of both matrices are the same, so the matrices are the same.
Nice. Okay, that was fast. I hope you're gonna uh, digest it, ask me about it in class. A couple of, of loose ends here. As a quick corollary to that, if, if U and T are linear operators and we just pick one basis for V, alpha, so remember when I only write an alpha there, it's shorthand for sort of alpha, alpha. It means I'm using the same basis. Well, uh, then the uh, matrix of the composition is the product of the matrices, all with respect to the alpha basis. Okay, follows immediately from the theorem. A couple of loose ends here, some notation. If you don't already know it, it's a very handy notation in mathematics, this symbol called the Kronecker delta. So I and J are two indices there, and the Kronecker delta is a two-valued function. It takes the value zero if I and J don't match, and it takes the value one if they do. Okay. So that's the Kronecker delta. It's notationally convenient in many circumstances. Um, the n by n identity matrix, which we'll denote by I sub n, it's the n by n matrix whose ij entry is delta ij. So that is, if i and j are equal, you're a diagonal entry, it's one. If i and j are not equal, you're an off diagonal entry, then it's zero. So the n by n identity matrix is the matrix whose diagonal entries are zero, off diagonal, or sorry, diagonal entries are one, off diagonal entries are zero. Last theorem, I'm just gonna discuss it, not going to go through the proofs of this. I'll have you think about it. It's a great chance for you to practice your definitions of matrix multiplication and so on. Every statement in this theorem says that two matrices are equal. The only way to show two matrices are equal are to compare them entry by entry, so you can practice your skills. But this is the theorem of matrix algebra. Um, I'm gonna skip even reading all the details. You can look at it. All these dimensions are just so that things match. There's a lot going on. I've got an M by N matrix, two N by P matrices, two Q by M matrices. So as you're looking at this theorem, I would at least carve out, like, let, let's do something together. It says B and P are B and C rather are n by p. Well, when you sum n by p matrices, you get an n by p matrix. A is m by n. Okay, well, that product is allowed, right? Because the uh, n's match on the inside, and the result is m by p. Okay, you can check the same uh, over here. So, so it's just saying that matrix multiplication distributes over addition on both sides. Matrix multiplication is not commutative in general. Uh, when you scale a product, you can scale either factor. So you can put the scalar on the product, on the first factor, on the second factor. Uh, when you left multiply by the identity matrix, you don't do anything. When you right multiply by the identity matrix, you don't do anything. Please notice that uh, I'm trying to be dimensionally careful here. A has M rows, so I am on the left n columns, so i n on the right. And then finally, uh, if the dimension of v is n, and you pick some ordered basis, and you want to write down the identity map, that is your 1 sub v uh, uh, in that ordered basis, you're going to get the identity matrix. And that's because 1 sub v of vj is vj for every j. So, so when you go to write vj as a linear combination of the basis vectors, it's one vj and no vi's for i not equal to j. So you'll exactly produce this matrix. Okay, that was fast. It was a lot of information, but I hope you rewind it and watch it at your own pace. And thanks for listening.